So, hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Thinking Aloud about film. Uh, today, we're very glad uh, to have Pamela Hutchinson uh, join us. Uh, she is Miss Silent Cinema, the queen of silence. Uh, and uh, silent cinema was an important strand of Ritrovato, but that's not the only reason why we have her uh, here today. Uh, Ritrovato this year was a return yeah, to on-site. Uh, they made a lot of interesting changes. The program was amazing, but also so much that no individual could cover it. <laughs> so uh, thus, uh, uh, the three of us here today. So Pam, kind of your your overall impression. My overall impression of Richard Varto, it was amazing to be back. Um, the last two years, the festival's gone ahead hybrid, but I wasn't there. I think most of us weren't there. So it was wonderful to be back. Um, as ever, the Silent Film Strand is a film festival within the film festival. You could watch nothing but silence. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I was a bit, a bit more omnivorous than that. I thought it was a really strong program, almost, almost felt too full after my experience going back to Pordenoni last year because I was, uh, I was a bit overwhelmed by the choices. Hmm. I think that was the case with me as well. Richard? Yeah, similar really. As I said, we really missed it over the last couple of years. The, and probably it might be that the, I don't think there were any more films than there have been in previous years, but I think we're just not used to that, that level of um, overwhelming numbers of films that you know you can't possibly see everything there's five screens i think going on simultaneously from 9 a.m till midnight <laughs> so there's there's no way that that everyone can, anyone can see everything but it, it just the seeing the films in person see, seeing people in person and getting views of other people on films was, was just amazing hmm. how do you think the uh system worked uh, this year pam <laughs> uh it was a new system we had to pre-book tickets what was your view of that? Well, I remember thinking this would be quite controversial, but I actually really enjoyed it. I think I wasn't alone in the end. So you, one of the joys of Bologna has always been that you can sort of wake up in the morning and, and you know see a musical and then decide whether you want to go and see the Holocaust drama or the silent film shorts. But actually you could still do that with this pre-booking system. You just had to sort of make your decisions a little bit further in advance. Mm -hmm. You could still sort of meander through the program at will and there was no uh, queuing and getting kicked out of screening so i was uh, mm. i was all for it in the end richard yeah i'd, I'd agree with that as a, yeah because uh, as you say no previously you could just wander in and out at will um this now you can still wander out at will <laughs> 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 you can't wander in um so yeah there was some controversy about it people not liking that change but i i think what i found was you have to make some most of your choices in advance but you can then like you know a couple of weeks out of the festival but you can then chop and change later on so i certainly made a lot of changes uh, you know one day for the for the next day kind of thing mm. plus you, you you could also most things get in at the last minute but the the worst thing about the old system was as, as pam said for a popular screening you just were, felt you had to go down early and potentially miss the end of another film in order to get a seat in the next film the only problem that remains and a few people have flagged this up is that they were quite strict about not letting not letting people in late um, mm -hmm. to screenings which you know sometimes if your previous screenings overrun um by five minutes or whatever because of an introduction and you race to the next cinema and you have a ticket but they won't let you in that's a little little strict i think so hopefully they'll tweak that kind of thing next year I must say, I loved it. I think it's a huge improvement over other years. I do not miss the queuing in the heat, uh, the arriving and finding that someone has reserved five seats and what you thought was empty is not empty. I like going in at the last minute with the security that I have my seat and going to it. So mm -hmm. I would like, you know, congratulations to Richard Vato. I hope that you fine tune this as, uh, you know, Pam and Richard have said, but overall, I think it's a huge improvement that I really welcome. Yeah, and, and one thing that's worth flagging is, is that, the, and no one was really aware of this, they, so they, they released the first set of tickets for booking, I think about two, well, the, like the day after they'd revealed the programme. Um, 
but that was only half of the tickets in each screen and a whole bunch you know the other half of the tickets got released two days before the festival so actually the people were panicking and you know booking everything in a hurry but actually you didn't really need to do that mm. um, i was very omnivorous in my viewing like mm. like pam uh but looking at the program now <clears throat> It's almost like I feel a pang because actually there were entire sections that I missed. Uh, and, you know, the cinema libero was something I saw nothing about, you know, much to my shame, really. And also the whole Yugoslavian cinema strand, which I would have loved to have seen, mm. you know, kind of I didn't. So are there strands that you that you missed out on that you would have liked to have seen, but, uh, you know, other priorities yeah. took over? I didn't see anything Japanese. There was Japanese strand. Um, I did see something from Cinema Libero and from Yugoslav Cinema, but not much. Um, when I do my planning for Ritrovato, whatever the system, I always think, start with the silence and then fill around. And um, I almost regret seeing so many silence because there were so many other things on offer, but I can't say that. You have to delete that from the podcast, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Richard? Uh, yeah, I didn't see... I, I think the only silence I saw were, were the ones in the, in the Piazzetta uh, outside. Um, I only saw one of the German 1930s musical comedies, and actually I really enjoyed that, so I regret not seeing more of those. Um, I didn't see any of the Japanese films. Um, but again, I think I, what I find is I, I, uh, yeah, Pam has a strategy on the, on the silence. I tend to have a strategy of looking at the, the... For people who haven't been there, there are two really big cinemas, um, and then there are three smaller screens down at the Ginoteca and this year there was a third smaller screen or four, fourth smaller screen about 10 minutes away I tend to focus on the two big screens because mm -hmm. that's kind of more fun mm -hmm. seeing films in that that size of screen so it's, sort of my first call is to just try and book what's on there and work out what the mm -hmm. best combination is and so that's kind, that kind of dictates what I see but it, it does as you say it does mean you miss out on stuff but what, what was good is the ability because there are repeat screenings of stuff was to be able to um, you know pick up on other strands. So I saw a few of the Yugoslav films, I saw a few of the Peter Laurie films, a few of the Sophia Loren films, and it, it, it was a good good mix. Mm. I want to again congratulate uh, uh, Ritrovato because I thought the addition of the Cinema Europa was mm. to me excellent. It's, it's a lovely cinema. It was wonderful <clears throat> to discover a new part of town. Uh, and actually I found that I could fit it in very well, you know, around, you know, my main viewing was also in the Arlecchino. Uh, uh, and the Piazzetta. Um, but, uh, you know, once you figured out how to get there, it was easy and the surroundings to it were marvelous. Mm. Um, so Pam, let's, let's focus on you. You're our guest. So what were your <laughs> highlights this year? Uh, so uh, one highlight for me was uh, there's a the strand that runs every year called uh, Tinto Anifa, which is a hundred years ago. And uh, we had these two marvellous um, silent film programmers, Marianne Lewinsky and Karl Rachko, and they're programming films from 100 years ago. We've got to 1922. Mm. And well, that sounds quite exciting to most people, I think, but um, there's a suspicion that the people running this festival are too pure. They think that cinema is a degenerate art form by this late <laughs> stage. So you always feel like you're doing something a little bit naughty these days when you go to these <laughs> screenings. So I was intrigued by what they put on. They put on some huge hits like Nosferatu and uh, Robin Hood, which I think you saw, but I was seeing some slightly stranger things. And one of my favorite things was a Louis Deluxe film called Le Femme de Mon Pas, The Woman From Nowhere. A slow, contemplative film about a woman going back to the house that she lived in as a married woman. Seeing another married couple living there now who are going through a similar crisis that she went through and uh, trying to offer a warning from her bitter experience to the young wife in that situation. So uh, very little plot and lots of character and atmosphere and strange things like this, you know, a, an Indian film with um, sc special effects scratched onto the screen, you know, um, some sort of dramas that didn't always work for me, but yeah, a really rich area to explore. And I finally got to see Salome on the big screen, the Alan Nazimova film sort of quite notorious from Hollywood Babylon. And so I, I, I missed that and I, I would have killed to see it because, you know, it's like a legendary film and a legendary performance. And I just didn't realize it was playing. So tell us more about that. Oh, Salome is great. So it's um, obviously it's based on the Oscar Wilde play, but it's uh, very specifically based on the edition of the play with the Aubrey Beardsley drawings. As uh, so Alan Asimova plays Salome, she's the writer and co-producer. Her partner Natasha Rombova makes the costumes, and and the costumes themselves are marvelous. They 
does look like Aubrey Beardsley, but also I was, it's set in the studio, so everything's offset against this deep black. Very, 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 very sexy, very, very strange, very, very queer, almost certainly. Um, you know, there's a lot of meaningful glances in Herod's Court, and there's lots of lipstick around the nipples in Herod's Court. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's not like a Bible studies class. It's pretty much an exploration of how far you can push pure art and performance in the context of a simple narrative and uh, I'm glad I finally saw it on the big screen. I'm sorry, Jose. I'll have to put a screening on in Birmingham for you. Well, you know, I think that it's ripe for queer rediscovery because I remember, I don't know, it might have been in one of Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon books or something, but I, I saw some of the stills from it and some of the costume and set designs, and they are so wild, right? Yeah. And it, 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 it did have, I mean, Rambova's designs are extraordinary, and it really does have, a kind of a, a lesbian slash queer thing to the whole Oscar Wilde, right? So I do think it is something, like I said, I would have killed to have seen it because I think it's it's a film that would have even, the, it, it's the moment for it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, there's a great interest on in all of these areas that it touches upon. Uh, so yeah, so lucky you. Um, yeah. Richard, what are, what are your highlights? Um, oh, so, so many, but uh, just to pick out a few, I think the, the strand that was most fun was the Hugo Fragonese strand, who's a, they, they'll often have a director that they're trying, who's a you know, slightly B-list director that they'll unearth and say, well, can, can we, what can we find out about this director by showing a, a strand of his films? And, and they, they, were, they, were, they were a mixed bag, but the, the good ones were really, really good. And I think we'll, we'll talk about them in more, more detail later on. But yeah, we'll have a um, special Fregonese. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but sort of work, work, yeah, sort of some 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 films with Hollywood stars, but also his early Argentine work and later work in the UK. It was, that was very interesting. Some of the restorations, so particularly El, the Bunuel film, which I, I, I love, sort of a fascinating film about coercive control before anyone had thought of the term coercive control, but it was completely textbook. Um, you know, what the guy was doing, it's exactly the the... The, the, the steps in that and, and also shoe shine the new, new restoration of that uh my only regret is that i saw the first screening of shoe shine and at the second screening one of one of the lead actors was there so the 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 80 year old man who played the the younger of the two main boys and they he was there at the start and then they got him up on stage at the end and apparently there was a five minute standing ovation and it was sort of everyone was crying and it was, yeah i think you, you're probably crying anyway at the end of shoe shine but when you see the, the sort of this kind of 80 year old man who's clearly had a you know he, he wasn't a professional actor you one assumes he's gone on to have a nice life and a nice family life and he's there on stage getting a standing ovation that, that was really nice um the sophia loren strand was was great fun um i, th I know you saw more of those those are me jose the peter laurie films Yugoslav films, more of a mixed bag, but there were one or two of those that were really great. Um, the other one, which I think hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about later, if, if you have an opportunity to see it, Jose, is Black God, White Devil, the uh -huh. new restoration of that, this sort of um, seen as the, the equivalent of Citizen Kane or Breathless in, in the history of Brazilian cinema. So that, that was... Uh, that was great. So yeah, I think that those are my my brief highlights. <laughs> Pam, or, or did you manage to catch any of the the restorations? That's one of the main kind of strands and uh, of of Ritrovato. Um, I caught uh, uh, La Mama and La Putain, uh, L, Ludwig, uh, quite a few, and they were extraordinary. I, I actually one of the things I valued most was being able to see those massively long films on a big screen where you just have to, you're, you, you, the, you have no option as to the time. Yeah, the time <laughs> is the time of the projection and you, you endure it. And it has a wonderful feel of you go in and out. It's interesting how your concentration focuses or mm. refocuses. And actually to me, those were two extraordinary experiences of cinema, Ludwig yeah. and, the, and the Jean Ustache. The, um, the moment and the Putana lasted about 10 minutes when I tried to watch that on DVD. So I, I, I'm sure I would have stuck with it on the big screen. Really stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> really great. Well, a few of my friends went to see Eight Deadly Shots, the finished drama that's I think, uh -huh. six or seven hours long. And at the time, I thought, think about how many films you're missing. But 
I realise now that's probably the best thing to do at Rich Romato because you've got that experience and you can mm. see six films the next day. Mm. The biggest restoration I saw actually accidentally fell into the 1922 strand, which was the massive MoMA and San Francisco Silent Film Festival restoration of Eric von Stroheim's Foolish Wives, oh. which is more than enough film for anybody. Even <laughs> It's only three hours. It's quite a lot of film for your money. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm quite cynical about von Stroheim often. It's sort of often I don't find it enough there to justify the running time. And this is a quite slight, but I, I think his char charisma, his charisma really struck, shone through in this. And uh, and then the final act is wonderful and very much worth um, huh? staying with it uh, in the mm. Piazzetta for. So it's a beautiful restoration. And uh, we had orchestral accompaniment in the piazza. So when I think of the silent film strand at Richard Varto, it's often all based in the Sala Mastroani, which is one of the smallest mm. screens in the cin Cinema Lumia. But then every so often it bursts into the piazza and that's always very exciting when we get a big sign in on the big screen. Seeing Nosferatu in the piazza is one of my cinematic moments of a lifetime, really, because, you know, I was with a group of people who will remain nameless, you know, but the film begins and we were outside in a bar and they were chattering, 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 chattering. I felt like slapping them. <laughs> and then at some moment, the film takes over and the whole piazza is silent, right? And it was marvelous to see, you know, I don't know how many thousands, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people being totally involved and gripped and silenced by this film from 1922. That was just so extraordinary. It was extraordinary, I thought. Mm. Richard, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I enjoyed that. But I think the other experience in the piazza that was really great was they, they showed the final episode of Get Back, um, oh. and which had been arranged by Olivia Harrison, who is, has been involved with the festival for, for some years because she funds Mexican film restorations through the Film Foundation because she she was she's from Mexico. Um, and so they showed the final part of Get Back, which is the, the one with the, the rooftop concert and a packed piazza. I only arrived just in time for the rooftop concert to start, which is kind of a good time to arrive. But seeing that projected on a huge screen and the reaction from the crowd, including like applause at the end of the concert, not, not just at the end of the film. You know, they, they, they applauded when Lennon said, you know, I hope you pass the audition. And, was like, hey. uh, and it, that, that was just a great kind of communal experience right. that, I mean, I've seen the whole thing on, on Disney Plus. Didn't, does, doesn't compare to seeing it like that. To add to that, uh, I only saw bits of the Blues Brothers um, because I don't really like the director very much and I don't really like the film very much. <laughs> Yeah, don't get you me started know, on but, that. <laughs> but I have, I, there are moments in that film that I really just wanted to, to watch with an audience. Mm -hmm. And actually the moment where Aretha Franklin sings Think, right? That I've never seen before because she literally stopped the show. And you don't mm -hmm. think of a movie stopping the show, right? But she did because as soon as the number was over, the whole piazza burst into this prolonged applause mm -hmm. in the middle of the film, right? Which is just, was just... <laughs> Fabulous to, to see, really. And, and to have her recognised like that there, I thought was, was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Pam? Yeah, music films always work really well in the Piazza Maggiore. So we saw a bit of singing in the rain. Beautiful girl, <laughs> you're a lovely picture. Beautiful girl, you're a gorgeous mixture of all and light under the big blue sky. My heart cries. Um, I remember from a previous year, Monterey Pop going across really well. And actually, also in another previous year, watching Jazz on a Summer's Day, but in the Jolly, when the Jolly cinema didn't have the best aircon. And if we'd have been alert and awake, it would have been, I mean, it was already quite magical to be sort of half asleep watching mm -hmm. Jazz on a Summer's Day. So uh, more music films, and that's obviously why the silence go down so well. So I watched Don La Nui in uh -huh. the Piazza Maggiore with an amazing soundtrack from two members of the Finnish band, Cleaning Women. And this uh -huh. is a late silent that got kind of, overlooked at the time but it's incredibly dramatic incredibly artistic um, and actually has a shock ending which uh, uh, opinions will definitely differ on but the sense of being part of a, a sort of audience in the open air who are very excited by this film and then completely um divided by the ending <laughs> was very exciting and i think 
you know, there's always applause for mm -hmm. Richard Varto screenings, but you can tell the difference between certain kinds of applause and certain, you know, others that when you can tell when the crowd really, really feels it. Mm -hmm. There were other strands of the festival that left me a bit disappointed, even though I'm struggling to find the reason. So, for example, I think I loved every single Sophia Loren film that was shown. Yeah, and she was amazing to see on a big screen. And yet, I, it left me disappointed. And I'm not sure if it's because, because I wanted to see more, you know, because I, I feel the festival didn't do enough for and with her. Yeah, I mean, I think it should have been her image plastered all over. Uh, you know, she is one of the great stars of world cinema, unlike any other, uh, in the sense that, you know, she was also a star in America, but her world stardom was not dependent on her American stardom. And it, it just kind of, I, I would have liked a more exhaustive programming. I would have liked to, to have known more uh, and to have seen more films. Yeah, I felt, you know, they had an opportunity in that strand since you're doing it, yeah, if you're going to do it at all, and it's in Italy, why not do more? Yeah, mm. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think what, what I found weird. about that, because they, they do have it. So every, just to give the context, every year there'll be a you know, major international icon who is the focus of one of the strands. And so this year's Sevilla Wren. Previous years, it's been Robert Mitchum, Jean Cabin, Marcello Mastriani. Um, so it's that that sort of person. So someone who's had, who's an international star with a very long career. Mm. So you can have a, and they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're always going to be showing a film a day. So it's seven or eight films. So I mean, okay, there's a restriction on how much they can show. But uh, I, I think I know what you mean about this season. They were, all the films I saw were really good, but they didn't quite have the wide ranging and eclectic approach that I've seen before. So like with, with, the first year I went, it was Robert Mitchum, and they were showing things ranging. From, they weren't obvious choices. There were things ranging from the 40s to the late 70s. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the Yakuza was the 70s one they showed and the Friends of Eddie Corbin and things like that. Similarly with Jean Gabin, they went from sort of 1940s May Grey movies to that excellent, this is Le Chat, the, the, the cat, yeah. the 1970s one with him, oh, Simone Signore. And, and so, so you, you, you saw this, you saw this person going from, you know, a young, sexy heartthrob to a kind of dignified aging character actor over the course of a week. And I didn't really get that sense with, with the Sophia Loren choices. They were all, they seem to be closer. They're all kind of, I suppose they were 50s, 60s, 70s, but they, they weren't the wide ranging set of genres that I've seen in other similar strands. I mean, maybe that's, you know, partly to do with maybe she's quite familiar to Italian audiences. It's almost like, how do you start describing someone who's sort of yeah. always there? You know, I saw two women and I saw arabesque, so I couldn't have seen two more different films. But yes. I also wonder whether it's something to do with being that kind of sex symbol, you know, where there's a sort of flattening out of her image across the films, like she's always got to look a certain mm. way. Um, she doesn't get to age in the same way as Jean Gabin does. And, you know, Jean Gabin. No, that's true. I, I, don't, I don't agree. I don't agree. OK, that's great if it's not true. Uh, because... <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about her is, to me, is how she is both woman of the people, peasant almost, and the most glamorous thing you've ever seen, right? And she can go from one to the other. So you mentioned arabesque, that's one, two women, the other. Yeah, exactly. you know, so, and, and she is unlike other sex symbols of the period in that, you know, you have her in Una Giornata Particolare with, uh, uh, Master, Marcello Mastriani, you know, playing like, you know, this woman aged beyond their years and poor housewife, yeah, fascist. Yeah. yeah, and likewise in two women, I mean, you know, she was only 25 or 26 when she was the mother of a grown daughter. Yeah, so, mm. so, so, you know, I, I, I do agree that maybe she's too familiar to Italian yeah. audiences. But it is an international festival. I would have liked to have seen a greater diversity of the Italian films, maybe the less well-known ones or the ones that were less successful. You know, there's just something, I suppose because she, she was so great to see. She has a smile that lights up the screen, really. She's so charismatic. And maybe it's just that feeling that 
she was so ravishing that you just want more of her, and that's the mm. only disappointment. I mean, but, in a sorry, but I do think they could have covered a, a greater uh, uh, period uh, and also a greater diversity of yeah styles of films. Yeah, mm. uh, but that's just me. <laughs> Oh, well, we'll get a new Lorenz season in, in the Beer Fry South Bank then, and I'll, okay. I'll come along to all of it. Just I like, might watch it, two women again, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, was, what I was just going to say, what was interesting was it actually turned into a, a kind of accidental De Sica season that wasn't, oh, wasn't promoted yeah. as a De Sica season, but, but so there was Shoe Shine, there was two women, which he directed Lorenz in, yeah. there was um, Too Bad She's Bad, which he. he Co-starred with Lorraine in, in, a, in a comedy role, and um, Anna Le, More Le, a something else. Yeah, and La Riffa the, from Boccaccio Seventy, which he he, he directed. Yeah. So that's kind, of, uh, in a way, the kind of um, although they didn't promote this as a De Sica strand, the wide ranging look at his career as an actor and director, or you know, and a comedy actor and a director of heartbreaking you know, realism, realism and broad comedy, and then going back to heartbreaking you know, realism. Later on, with two women, was was really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. He was a discovery for me. Mm -hmm. Seeing him play farce, yeah, with Lorraine and Panamore, whatever, and also <clears> too bad, <throat> bad. I mean, they were wonderful together, and he was so mm -hmm. charismatic and so. I mean, the the performance was so stylized. He had a style of farce. It was, you know, a, a real kind of discovery. Yeah, for me, uh, mm -hmm. seeing him like that. So that was an accidental. Strand. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are so many accidental strands, and there's so many films that come from different strands that would work so well together. Um, yeah. So you make your own little double bills as you're putting the festival program together. Mm. And and you know when when you seeing these films so close to each other, you do sort of make connections. And I like with the Fregonese films, uh, I, you know, there were several that, that involved prison breaks. I mean, there were two that involved prison breaks where the sidekick to the lead character was Peter Graves and it was sort of you know films made years apart and you, you just sort of make these connections and, and start to think oh yeah there is a, there is there is something here there is a, there is a, a commonality in this guy's works um, but yeah we get um, I was I mean at one point I, you know you just get mixed up about which strand things are in so I was telling someone I was going to see Man in the Attic which is Fregonese film, which is the same, based on the same novel as, as Hitchcock's The Lodger. And I, I, for some reason, got it in my, into my head that actually that was part of the Peter Laurie strand, not the Fregonese strand, until he corrected me. And then we started, came up with this idea of a film where it's like The Lodger starring Sophia Loren, where she moves into a lodging house and everyone thinks Sophia Loren is Jack the Ripper. And uh, I mean, that, that would be a great film, but... <laughs> I think but I, everything blurs into one over the eight days. That's the problem. I do, because I, I saw um, James Mason in Fregonese in One Way Street. Mm. I really love that, but I also saw him in Court, the Max Ophel's um, mm. psychodrama. And then Court in itself was so similar in theme to the wonderful restoration I saw of All That Money Can Buy. And so just you can just keep hopping from one film to another. Yeah. I, I think the silent era serial heroine Protea had a lot on Sophia Loren in Arabesque. You know, you know. I feel like we can remix the entire program to our heart's content. Mm. To go back to the silence, one of the fantastic experiences of the festival to me, for me, was to see the uh, the arc, carbon arc projection of the 1902 uh, coloured uh, films in the Piazzetta. Mm.
again, that, that was just like so beautiful to see. Actually, you know, the light in the projector itself. Then, then actually the hand colored, uh, the hand coloring of the fireworks, it was just astonishing, you know? Wow. And I, I just wonder if you caught that and what you thought. I mean, I didn't see that this time, but I have seen similar programs at this festival. I was very sorry to miss it. I was, I was unaccountably detained, um, but uh, hand colour, stencil colour and the carbon art projectors themselves are like the essence of beautiful cinema. I saw a much later stencil coloured film when I was in the Piazzetta um, with the carbon art projector, which was the uh, British um, advert for fabric dye changing hues which might not sound that dramatic, but if you look it up on BFI player, you'll see how pretty it is. But there is something about the quality of light that is really astonishing. And there's something about knowing that you're looking at someone's work directly on the screen, the woman who painted all these films, you know, you're seeing the, the faces from the past, you're also seeing the, the handiwork, the sort of craftsmanship of the past. It's a really moving experience. And if you, if you go to Richard Varto and you don't see the carbon art projector in action, you are really missing out, I think. It, it really is a, just a, an amazing experience. And it's just sort of, an, I always want to spend at least one evening. I think they do two or three across the course of the week. Just, mm. just I mean, you, you just sit in the bar watching these things, but it, it's just a, you know, just a, so, such a lovely experience. And I guess that's one of the things that, as you're saying about the, looking at the physical film, that being back there in person, and obviously you know, it's been, we've done it online the last couple of years, um, but just seeing the, you know, some some digital projections of, of new restorations, but in other cases, you know, vintage prints or you always the best print they can get, but you know, sometimes slightly cracky thirty-five millimeter prints, and and you do, you know, pe is it being snobbish saying, oh, you must see this on film, not on on celluloid, not on digital, but it, it, it you know, it is different. They're, they're, you can't quite put your finger on it, but there is a different quality to it. So Pam, one of the things that the festival <coughs> does is it awards uh, a prize, I guess, or you know, for for best uh, uh, DVD, yeah. And you are on yeah. the jury of that. So I wondered. I don't want to compromise you by asking anything secret, but <laughs> you can just tell us what were the highlights of the of 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 the choices who won, yeah, kind of, you know, uh, um, what maybe, you know, deserved higher, or you thought deserved higher praise, but maybe didn't get as much recognition as you would have liked and so on. Well, um, I think this is something to do with what's being put out and what's being put out but with special care on archive uh, DVDs generally, but it was an incredibly strong field for silent cinema, like incredibly strong. There were so many great silence. So if, if, you, if your label submitted a silent film and you didn't get a nod, I mean, the, the, they were fighting with each other. So I think like our Peter Van Bat Award went to a luxurious a box set of the, the sort of horror documentary, hybrid documentary, Haksan, which I just want to disappoint everyone by saying doesn't have English subtitles, but you know, I now have a Haksan tote bag if, uh, if that's gonna make me popular in a particular supermarket. I think the really the, the best award we give out is always to the box sets because the box sets get the most attention. And so we had a great example of a tie. We had the Criterion Collections, Melvin Van Peebles box set, which only has a few films on it because he only made a few films, but it's got so many extras and films and documentaries and the film is sun made. And it completely makes the case for him being a radical and innovative filmmaker. But we also shared the prize with something that equally a labor of love, but uh, even equally revelatory in its own way, which is the silent film box set of Julien Duvivier. It's called Cinema of Discovery. And these are beautiful restorations of incredibly gorgeous late French silent films, which are sort of unbeatable. I also gave my personal choice award to Working Girls by Lizzie Borden, another Criterion release, but one that I felt really, really deserved a nod. There were several more I felt could, uh, could have got a bit of attention. The, the release of Philibus, which is this sort of wonderful sort of cross-dressing air pirate, serial, anti-heroine, uh, criminal mastermind really, uh, film, which was beautifully done. And there was lovely work from the, uh, the BFI on the, the films about Antarctic exploration. And honestly, I was overwhelmed by choices. And if we'd have done a separate silent DVD awards, we still wouldn't have got through all of them. But yeah, it's really exciting to see things. And there's, there are films that I get to see judging the DVD awards, which I don't know that I would have come across otherwise. One that really um, leaps out to me, and I don't know if you guys know this film, but I think you'd really love it. It's from the early 80s, and it's a Slovak film called Night Riders, mm. which, as the name suggests, it's genuinely a Western. It's set on mm. the Slovak-Poland border and a village where the villagers are all smuggling 
as much as possible because they're saving up money. They think the entire village is going to move to America. And so we get a brand new customs officer in town trying to crack down on this with um, predictable results if you've ever seen a Western. Really, really fantastic film. And it pains me to say that it must be beautifully restored because it looks good as new. Because I'm like, it's from the 80s. It must be really new. But <laughs> no, no, no. It has, has worked. So, for example, something like that. Hadn't heard it mentioned before, didn't see it, wasn't anywhere in the festival, just this beautiful DVD that comes out and you think, well, mm. Blu-ray and uh, yeah, um, party at mine if you ever want to come to the <laughs> rich, uh, sub fest of Rich Rivato. <laughs> okay, great. Um, any other highlights? Any other highlights for me? Um, a late silent called, oh, from the festival. From the yeah. festival now, yeah. Yeah. A late, a late silent called Tuma Partien, which um, featured Francesca Bettini in, a, in one of her later roles being absolutely magnificent and uh, Rudolf Klein Roger too. Uh, that's definitely one that has to, to stick with me. And the chance, oh my God, the chance to see two Kira Muratova films on the big screen. Absolutely revelatory, stunning stuff. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, thank you very much, Pam. Uh, a pleasure. Thank you for having me with my crazy yeah. voice and all. <laughs> <laughs> no, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time, particularly, you know, uh, as you struggled out of bed with COVID to, to be able to join us. So Yeah, an extra really gift that quite a few people came back from Richard Varto with. <laughs> yeah, I came back with a box set, a, a catalogue and, yeah, a couple of extra bars on my chest. I, I mean, I'm lucky I didn't. I'm, I'm fine. It's OK. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Well, thank you very much, Pam. Um, yeah. We'll leave you here, and Richard and I are going to continue with a few comments on Peter Lorre and the uh, Weimar musical Strand. Yeah, so yeah, thanks very much to Pam for joining us. That was really great. Um, but we have two little strands uh, to continue with. Uh, one is the Peter Lorre section. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you saw quite a bit of that. Um, I think it's one of the great things about Ritrovato that, you know, it can take someone who was a star, but not an A star, not a huge box office star, mm -hmm. yeah, who kind of varied between, you know, supporting roles and leads and kind of B films, uh, and renew our interest in figures like that. So what did you see of, 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 of the Peter Lorre strand and what view have you ended up with on Peter Lorre? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. So I saw, I, I, probably saw four or five of them. The earliest one I saw was um, the suitcases of hair OF, um, mm -hmm. which was 19, uh, early 30s, I think. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a, it was great fun. It was possibly a bit too long because it was a bit of a one joke thing, but it was a, a it's kind of absurdist comedy about this small town where they think this billionaire is coming to visit them and, and uh, you know, mayhem ensues and that, that 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 was really fun it had kind of a young uh a young, young and fairly um quite quite large peter laurie in this one yes he obviously lost a lot of weight later on um as a in this one more of a kind of comedy figure than than you generally saw him as um the the other the fascinating thing about it which i didn't realize but i don't think you did either is that one of the uh one of the actresses in it was Hedy Lamarr in her mm. first kind of her first named role um, before she was she wasn't called Hedy Lamarr at that point. But that, that that was fun. I think you saw that one too. That was an amazing film, actually. Mm. I thought because it was also very relevant to our contemporary culture. It really was about kind of neoliberalism and you know where you can con people. <coughs> with an idea and actually the belief in the idea makes the idea come true. So, you know, it's about uh, this rich man who's coming into town. And so they all begin building land and building infrastructure and so on. And the expectation of making huge amounts of money from the rich guy who in fact never comes, right? But yeah, but the, the place is left with those buildings, that infrastructure, that renewed way of life. And it also has musical numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that was wonderful to see. And that was one of the ways in which this film really intersected with the other strand on Weimar musical comedies. So I thought that was for me a terrific find. Yeah, yeah. So I also saw um, Beast with Five Fingers, which was, was great. I mean, that was you know, from that surprisingly large genre of films about the severed hands of concert pianists mm -hmm. <laughs> um and uh that, that was kind of a classic peter laurie role he's, he's, he's this sort of creepy 
little guy who um, you know is, is is scheming against everybody. But the, the very effective, and I thought the, uh, the I, I actually couldn't work out quite how they how they did some of the effects with the hand. It was very 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 well done. You see M. I did, yes, yeah, which I, I'd seen before, obviously, but yeah, that was. Um, I mean, to me, that I've seen it several times before, and actually, I was surprised by how much of it I've forgotten, mm. uh, and how great it was. The restoration was like seeing a different kind of film on a big screen. I mean, I've seen it previously, you know, on kind of yeah. blurry copies, and just having this this sharp image, the cinematography, I'd completely forgotten about the gangland court, you know, mm. uh, at the end, which of course is key to the film because, you know, it's meant, it's meant to be about fascism and yeah, uh, you know, and the criminals kind of, you know, uh, uh, creating rule of law and so on. And that I completely forgotten. I mean, I just really remembered Peter Lorre, right? Mm. Uh, which is a testament to his power as a presence and as an actor, because actually, He's a relatively, I mean, he's obviously the child murderer, um, so the protagonist of the film, but he occupies a lot less role, a lot, a lot less of the narrative than you think he does, right? And that became kind of very evident on this reviewing. Yeah. So again, to me, seeing that was one of the experiences of the festival, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, to see it on a big screen in a marvelous uh, copy was, was a joy. Yeah, I also saw... Um... Crime and Punishment, um, yes, sort of mid thirties adaptation of of the, the 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 opening credits stress the literary provenance of it, saying you know based on a novel by the the greatest Russian novelist Dostoevsky, starring the famous European star Peter Lorre. Um, so I guess that was probably off the back of M, and and it was kind of seen as a a prestige project. I mean, it's sort of interesting that in in that first. I don't know if that was his first American film, but he's, you know, he's, he's the, the, the opening credits say the famous European star Peter Lorre as if this is a really big deal. But yeah. then later on, he's making kind of, you know, B movies and um, smaller parts in gangster films. And so that's quite, quite an interesting career trajectory. Yes, I, I loved Crime and Punishment. I thought, um, you know, the cinematography was just astonishing. And actually, again, having the main role be a murderer and in consideration of the Hays Code of the period, you know, and being absolutely clear that Sonia is a prostitute that is communicated so clearly without it being referenced in any way at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's perhaps why they that's perhaps why they make such a big thing at the start of saying based on a fake it explicitly says based on this novel by Dostoevsky, little asterisk, the greatest Russian writer written in 1866 and they, they they bang on about this possibly to say this is not uh, this is not porn this is great literature that we're adapting here and perhaps you get more leeway in in terms of the production code by stressing the literary and artistic provenance of your work i don't know or well, that's what i, I think, hoped <laughs> i think um one of the great things about ritrovato is having you know is doing things like the strand on Peter Lorre because in so many of these films, The Man Who Knew Too Much, um, he plays a killer, mm. right? A crime and Punishment, uh, 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 The Face Behind the Mask, right? Um, you know, he plays a killer, he plays a marginal figure. Sometimes he plays deviants of other kinds. So when I was an adventurous, it really is suggested that he and the Eric von Stroheim character are lovers, mm. right? Uh, so, you know, there is a kind of an interesting uh, theme that runs through it of the exile, the person with no home, the person who even in his home doesn't fit in, you know, the person driven by lusts he can't control or, you know, compulsions he can't control, like to murder or, yeah, it's kind of, you know, a very unsettling presence that is also made rather moving because he's such a great actor. You feel mm. his, his pain, yeah, and you you his humor, yeah, his humanity in the face of all of this outsiderness. And yeah, and I think he he even manages that in when he's in some not very good films, which I, I, I don't I don't class the films. I think the films showed Richard Vardy were a really good set of choices, 
but he also did some, you know, pretty ropey films later in his career. And there's a, there's a British one called Double Confession, mm. where he's, I mean, again, similarly, he's this outsider, he's a gangster, and he's in love with William Hartnell. <laughs> and um, he, he kills because he's in love with William Hartnell. Um, and again, it's a sort of similar, it's a really, really good performance in not great material, you know, he just brings a touch of class to it. Well, the one I didn't see, which I, I, I did, it's on YouTube, so we'll catch up on it, is the, was it the, the one he directed? The, Never Alone. Um, yeah, did you see that yeah. one? I saw that, and actually I loved it. Um, you know, it really is, um, it connects to the face behind the mask. So the face behind the mask <coughs> is about this, this hardworking man with many skills, who emigrates, you know, to the United States. Um, he's caught in a fire, uh, his face is burned, and then he's got to turn to crime, yeah? So, uh, and the Verlonen is about the scientist uh, who is used by the Gestapo for his science and who also turns to crime. And then in a prison camp, uh, discovers that the guy who betrayed him, the Gestapo man, you know, has now once more come to work as, as his assistant. And the whole film is told in flashbacks. Mm. And the success of that film for me is the visuals. You know, it really resonates with concentration camps. Uh, the, the film is full of ruin, ruins of Berlin, of smoke and fire and yeah gray yeah uh, it's a black and white film so even the smoke and the fire is like everything is gray everything is destroyed everything is bleak yeah and these killers are still kind of moving through this world right mm. uh it's a it's a film of mood really and the mood is bleak but you can understand completely why it wasn't a hit but i mm. think it's a very successful film actually yeah i'll we'll have to catch up on that one mm. uh now did you catch any of the uh, Weimar musical comedies? Uh, only one of them, which was shown on, on the final day, um, which was, uh, I f forget the title. It's the one where there's a guy that gets a um, job. He, he gets cast in an operetta, but him and his friend are penniless and they have to pawn the jewellery and pawn, get the dinner suits back. Yeah. It was, oh yeah, A Girl You Don't Forget, So I Needle the Gist. Uh, okay, I haven't seen that one. I think. Oh, it was uh, brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was fun. It was you know a screwball comedy. There were songs. There was there was laughter. It was yeah. It was. It was, it was well, good. I want to say a bit more about that because I think these films are amazing. They are my discovery of the film festival. You know, they are musical comedies that have a real Weimar spirit. You know, so everyone is stealing or getting by or you know kind of taking fruit from a stand, everyone's hungry. Uh, there's one in which the meat cute is that two people are sharing a bed, but one by day, one by night, they hate each other. You know, <laughs> they, they think the other person's a pig leaving washing and so on. Uh, and of course they end up kind of, you know, meeting together. So, you know, that feel of hardship, of a free sexuality, of a kind of a wink, a slightly bitter wink at the world. Mm. Yeah, those qualities that you associate with, with Weimar uh, are all in these films. Yeah, and that was, that was in the one I saw too, because they, no, you know, no, nobody's got any money. So there's a, there's a theatre producer and everyone's saying, hey, you're taking a risk putting a new show on. He's like, well, yeah, if it doesn't go on, I won't pay anybody. Um, the guy who gets cast in the lead, he's, been, he's told to turn up to meet one of the backers at this hotel, but he has to wear his... his um, you know, top top hat and tails, but he's pawned the top hat and tails to pay the rent, and so they have to like go through some sell some encyclopedias to pay to get the money back to pawn to unpawn the uh, the the stuff. They end up with you know they've only got one suit. They have to get rid of their other clothes to have the top hat and tails. So he spends the whole time wearing this same outfit. His friend has to you know has lost his job and not told his wife, and so they then turn their their flat into a boarding house, and it, it, it is every the, you know between the the, the the laughter and the songs, you know it's all about everyone scrabbling for money, and, and as you say, there is there is just this because you know what's going on in the background um, yeah. while these films are being made, and and that's kind of looming over them. It's it's very interesting. 
they're very they're very entertaining they're kind of really modern um <clears throat> also made me rethink what we know of the musical genre because you know one of the arguments is well it's an american genre right mm. and you know and part of it is because they deploy music and dancing well these films also have a lot of dancing yeah not all of them right but you know the, all the films that are set in nightclubs and so on they all have dancing and are all quite inventive with dancing you know so uh and it has a kind of a more free sexual kind of flow and representations of sexuality that the Hollywood musicals lack, even the pre-codes, right? Mm. Uh, and I just kind of love them, actually. I think they were a real revelation. Uh, and uh, the programmers, uh, which uh, is Lucas Forster, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an amazing uh, program and a real find uh, for me. Mm. Um, so now this brings us just maybe to overall comments on this. Yeah, I, I guess what, what we're sort of on, we're talking about strands that only one of us saw i'll say a little bit about the yugoslav films ah, yes, please. Not covered. um so I, I saw there was a strand of, of films from the former yugoslavia all made in the 50s and 60s and it was a bit of a i saw three or four of them two or three of them were really great um i, I have to say it was a bit of a mixed bag and, and i didn't I, I kind of rearranged and saw other stuff instead but the the the, the ones that were really excellent were focused on world war ii um, and there were obviously various various parts of what was your Yugoslavia that went in different directions during World War II. So there's a film called Tree or Three, which was a, a portmanteau film. Um, three stories set, one set at the beginning of the war, the Germans just invaded, one set in the middle of the war with, with partisans escaping, and one set at the end of the war where the, the, um, the locals are essentially putting the Germans on, on trial. Uh, all with the same lead actor, but apparently playing playing a different character, although he may be maybe the same character. But I thought that was fascinating and, and, and a real discovery. The the other one that was incredible was a film called uh, The Ninth Circle, which was uh, um, about the Holocaust. And so this was set in Croatia, where Croatia essentially set up a, um, as, as the introduction said, they were very much on the wrong side of history. They set up a proxy fascist state. Um, so they, they, they hadn't been invaded at this point. But they were persecuting Jews and setting up concentration camps. Um, so the, the the trigger for the plot is that there are two families, and the daughter of and one family is Jewish. The daughter of the Jewish family just happens to be staying overnight at the other family's house when her family are all rounded up and, and taken away to the camps. So she ends up staying with the Croatian family, who then say, "Well, I'll tell you." Tell you. The parents say, well, "Well, what we'll do is you can get married to the son, and then you'll be okay." And like the son is the son's reaction is a bit hang on a minute do i get do, do i get a say in this he's a teenager he's got a girlfriend and it's, it's this very interesting moral dilemma about how he he reacts to that he does eventually come around to the situation and, and, and do the right thing but it's a really tragic film and it, it sort of finishes with this amazing sequence in a, in, in a concentration camp which is very not realistic at all it has a strange dreamlike quality and it's a very very haunting and very kind of affecting film i think um, but yeah, it was a some some of that strand was great, others not so much. And there was there was one I tried to watch that had no English subtitles, and that was a bit bit of a bit unfortunate. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting exercise. I think I, for people who've not been to Ritrovato, generally they'll I think I'd say they classify the strands in a number of ways. One is by one is by time, and we talked with Pamela about the. 100 years ago strand there's also 120 years ago strand one is by space so they look at particular regions like here this year japan or former yugoslavia and the other is looking at particular individuals like sophia loren peter lorry hugo freganese so it's kind of a slightly bewildering program which is i mean that's the that's the size of the program um you can see that um but you can navigate yourself all and the way around so it. let me let me show it yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah it, it's i mean thinking about it as a whole it, it is a you know it's a bewildering amount of films i don't know how many films in total that were shown over the week yeah. but you it's once you get the hang of how it works you can navigate your way around quite easily because the generally of all these five or six screens each one each day is showing something from the same strand so 
you know, there's one screen where every day nine o'clock it was Peter Laurie, eleven o'clock it was Sophia Loren. Down the road, it was you know nine o'clock it would be um, Yugoslav cinema. Cinema and eleven o'clock it was it was something else. So you once you work out that structure, you, you can you can navigate it. So I think well actually one 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 final thing to talk about actually I guess is the is the transition from it being a hybrid online festival to being totally in person this year with no online presence so I just wonder what, oh, okay. you, what you think of that I think that's an interesting point to discuss well I I I think it's a mistake uh in the sense that I think for the festival I mean it was a fabulous festival it was great to be back on live you know live I do think it's a mistake to not have at least a certain strand online mm. right yeah for those people who can't get to Bologna yeah it would be great that you know they could join in for part of it, and actually, since they figured out how to do that last year, it seems a bit begrudging to me to not have at least a selection of films that people who can't afford to go to Bologna can nonetheless kind of uh, yeah. pay to see uh, and benefit from, uh, you know, the 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 knowledge and the scholarship uh, that uh, Ritrovato kind of brings out every year. Really. Yeah, I, th I think it's, I mean, this is not purely a, an issue with Ritrovato, it's the case with, with many, many other, you know, film festivals, cinemas, theatres, art galleries, whatever, that, that found out ways of doing things online over the last two years and have just basically stopped. And there are people who, as you say, for cost reasons or for all sorts of other reasons, you know, disability or, you know, practical, or still people who are worried about travelling, you know, um, who, who can't get there in person. And, and it is a shame. I, I, I mean, having got there, it's like, yeah, I, I much, much prefer this in a million ways to what sitting watching it online. Uh, but I, I do think it's, it's a shame to totally forget that 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 audience. Uh, I mean, and it does strike me that you know, there, even if they don't have the funding to set up their own online presence again, there are other ways of doing it. What was interesting was Mubi put on um, the the day that Foolish Wives was screened in the piazza movie had that, as that that new restoration is the film of the day and you know there's a bunch of movie people who are at Richard Arthur every year and you kind of think do you talk to each other and, and um you know have a movie does have strands dedicated to particular festivals they can have a Richard Arthur strand and that that way you know it's, it's a win-win but yeah it's a shame but yeah well that would be uh my view I mean I wish that they would keep it as they have this year but just add a digital strand I mean yeah. there's no reason not to uh, and it would be a lot more inclusive. Uh, how would they do so? And actually, I think much better for the festival in the long term. Mm, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The component. I think it's something that all festivals should do now, now that we know how. Uh, so um, we're going to wrap this up for now. Uh, we are going to do individual podcasts that arise from Ritrovato on Hugo Fragonese, Sophia Loren, and Peter Lore and perhaps also on Foolish Wives. Yeah. Uh, yep. So we'd like to to thank uh, Pam, who was a real heroine today, you know, fell down by COVID, but a are <laughs> from the dead to join us uh, uh, in uh, um, this evaluation and appreciation of uh, the 2022 Ritrovato. So I'm Jose. I'm Richard. We're thinking a lot about film, and thank you all very much for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.